The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Sami Shah. This is Ear to Asia. There does seem to be this weird disconnect with the way that people understand this massive Tibetan slash Himalayan slash Hengduan mountain area. They get that it's important, but they don't seem to get how important. This is like a special area that needs to have cooperation in order for it to be managed properly. And this cooperation needs to not just be from states, but you need to listen to the voices from the communities funneled up. In the Mekong and Salween River Basins, we see the production of local knowledge challenge these environmental impact assessments or government rhetoric. There's this methodology that's called Taiban research, invented by development-affected communities who were impacted by dams, along with local NGOs and academics in this region. In this episode, trickle-down tensions and the hydropolitics of transboundary river systems in Asia. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. Wherever there's an important body of water cutting across national boundaries, there's the politics of who gets what share of that precious resource. The hydropolitics of the river systems that originate in the eastern Tibetan plateau are especially vexed as they support the livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people across China, Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, India and Bangladesh. With a history in the region of colonialism, border disputes and competing interests, attempts at transboundary governance of the rivers inevitably pit cooperation against contestation. And it's not just national interests shaping the hydropolitics. Non-state actors like the private sector, NGOs and international organizations also have a role and a say. Transboundary negotiations on capturing or managing the water, for example, whether to build more dams or seek alternative methods, can generate considerable and sometimes intractable political heat. Other factors include the impact of water resource tensions on regional, ethnic and cultural diversity, health and the environment. Then there's China, with its economic and technological dominance, whose massive investment in water infrastructure, often well beyond its own borders, has led some to label it the region's hydro-hegemon. So, how to make sense of the tapestry of interests and tensions to be found along rivers such as the Mekong or the Brahmaputra? How do less powerful states negotiate with more powerful ones upstream? And what can policymakers and other stakeholders do to foster equitable and sustainable water governance across borders as climate change brings only greater uncertainty over the flow of water? Joining me to discuss are Dr. Ruth Gamble, an environmental, cultural and climate historian of the region from La Trobe University and Zali Fung, a University of Melbourne PhD scholar and currently a visiting scholar at the Rachel Carson Centre for Environment and Society in Munich. Welcome back to Air to Asia, Ruth, and welcome, Zali. Hi. Thanks very much. Ruth, starting with you, can you give us a picture of the river systems that originate from the eastern Tibetan plateau? Right. I think it might be actually a bit easier to talk about the plateau as a whole because they kind of crisscross the entire plateau. And basically what you have is one group of rivers starting in the southwest of the Tibetan plateau and another group in the northeast. So in the southwest around one sacred mountain that's called Mount Kailash, you have four rivers rising there, the Indus, the Sutlij, a couple of the tributaries of the Ganges River and the Brahmaputra. And then in the north east of the Tibetan Plateau, you have another group of four rivers rising there. You have the Yellow River, the Yangtze River, the Sawin River, and the Mekong River. So then one of these rivers, the Brahmaputra, crosses the plateau and at one stage goes within a couple of hundred kilometers of the Sawin and the Mekong and the Yangtze. So you have this one corner of the southeastern Tibetan Plateau where you have these four major major world rivers all running quite close to each other. Well, let's get some numbers then, just to give us an idea of the scale here. Uh, How many people are these river systems supporting and how much water is in these river systems, if you can measure such a thing even? 
Yeah, it's a bit tricky because on the like larger scale, if you're talking about how many people depend on that massive Tibetan river system, it could be almost two half the world's population. Yeah, but that doesn't mean people who are exactly drawing water from the river every day, right? So it's the same thing as if we think about the Murray-Darling in Australia. Not all of us live on the Murray-Darling River, but we all get food that's grown with the water from that system, right? So if you're thinking about who depends on that river, it's all the people of South, Southeast and East Asia. So a lot of people. Um, But if you're talking about people who actually live on the river, it comes down to only a few hundred million well, only a few hundred million, I suppose, yeah, is, yeah. <laughs> is is a particularly Asian description. Um, where do the rivers end up? Well, the Yellow River ends up near Beijing. The Yangtze River ends up near Shanghai. The Mekong River flows out from Tibet down through Vietnam. The Salween comes almost straight down in between Thailand and uh, Myanmar. And the uh, Brahmaputra does this massive kind of horseshoe turn. It goes east along the Tibetan Plateau and then through the world's deepest gorge and then comes back west through Assam and comes into a massive delta with the Ganges River that is basically Bangladesh. Bangladesh is like 80% delta. Zali, with such a widespread of region and then the peoples along it, what technologies are used to capture these water resources? Um, I think it really depends on which river basin you look at. If you look at the Salween River Basin, there's actually no major hydropower dams that have been built on the main stem yet. So it's Asia's, I think, last and longest free-flowing river. So that's really interesting. But of course, you'd have a lot of small dams and reservoirs and diversions to capture water and use it for irrigation, for example, in that basin. But in the Mekong, there's 13 large dams already built on the main stem and probably hundreds built across the basin of um, different size dams and many, many more plans. So it really depends on which basin you're, you're looking at, but some are more developed than others. Ruth, and how is the water used then? Um, I mean, the main things that you use water for is agriculture, 100%. Agriculture is where most water goes to. That's why we eat water from these rivers when we're eating food in these regions, yeah, and why the spread is so important. And then you also have industry, and then you have domestic water is not so much domestic water use, but then also it's used in these areas, well, not the Salween, but the Mekong and the Yangtze and the Brahmaputra for hydropower. So you get this combination of extracting water for human use, but then also using it to generate energy. Zali, I'm wondering, are there any general threats that can be identified as fairly consistent across these rivers? Um, I think there's a range of threats that are common across these river basins. And I think we should also think of them as compounding threats. So the river systems are threatened because these different factors are all layering upon each other and impacting the river system. So there's planned or built hydropower dams and water diversions across these basins. As Ruth mentioned, there's also these multiple competing uses, which can lead to over-extraction of the river. Climate change is impacting these river systems. So that's leading to more extreme events like flooding. It's also leading to unseasonable and unreliable rainfall patterns. And that really impacts people because people's livelihoods on these river systems are very seasonally dependent. You've also got rising sea levels in the deltas, which can lead to saltwater intrusion. So the salinization of freshwater resources. And then, of course, there's pollution from unregulated flows into the rivers, sand mining, deforestation. So there's a whole series of threats that these rivers are, are facing. Well, Zali, given the precious resources across multiple national boundaries, we've detailed how vast a region this is. How can any of this be managed across the length of these rivers? I mean, is transboundary governance even possible? Yeah, that's a good question. I'd say it's really difficult, uh, particularly because, as you said, the rivers cross so many boundaries and borders. And also we have a lot of fairly authoritarian governments in the region. But I suppose that also doesn't mean that it shouldn't be some sort of aspirational goal to get multiple stakeholders on board to manage the river better together. And I think that wouldn't just entail bringing riparian states together, which is already difficult enough, but also having communities and civil society actors who are quite directly dependent on the river and the river's health, bringing them all together to have a say in in how the river is managed. It does sound fairly utopian or idealistic. Ruth, is that is it a legitimate possibility? 
See, this is the good thing about being a historian because things that seem intractable at the moment when you look back in history, they go, oh, but it's only been a few decades. You know, if we think about the long history of the rivers, it's 60 million years since the two continents clashed into each other and they've been only stuffing it up for 50 years, right? So we can right, maybe roll it back a bit and try and undo some of these what seem like intractable problems. It is possible. They haven't been in place that long. And this one's particularly tricky because you don't just have multiple nations operating within that boundary, but they don't even agree where the border between the two countries is because you have this really long colonial legacy. Basically, the British and the Qing empires made up borders that they didn't know anything about. And then the Chinese and the Indians inherited them and they disagree on where the border is actually supposed to be. So they can't agree on the border. They can't agree about where the water crosses the border and how much water and who gets what. Yeah. So you have issues like when they started fighting in um, Galwyn four years ago, they stopped sharing water data. So the Indian government wasn't made aware if a flood or a monsoonal deluge was coming down the river. They just stopped telling them what was going on. So if we want to fix it, we have to kind of fix the border because what happens when you have less tensions around a border is borders tend to disappear then a bit. And you can start working across the border in more practical ways. And there are examples of this. Most of the examples I would say of people working across borders don't tend to be government to government. They seem to be community to community at lower levels. So there's a the thing. It's like before all of these countries invented their borders and started messing things up, there were communities living all the way along this river system that did manage it quite well. Yeah, so if we could kind of get back from the big authoritarian states down to the community focus, we may be able to get back to a better process of managing it. I'm optimistic because the mountains have been there for 60 million years and they'll probably still keep going and we'll get it together at some point. Well, you mentioned some of the conflicts. I mean, these interstate wars over freshwater resources, how common have they been in the last 50 to 60 years? And can you give us a few examples? I mean, I don't think that you get wars. And I think that there's actually a tendency, a lot of international relations people talk about coming war to wars a lot, right? I don't think that that's very likely. But what you do have is conflicts and arguments. So I can tell you about the Brahmaputra and then maybe ask Zali about the Mekong. Because in the Brahmaputra, what you tend to have is the Chinese government governs the top of the basin, that they can set up dams and hydropower projects. And then the water that comes down to India is, India has less control of it. But then India sets up barrages and extracts water before the water gets to Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is at the bottom and has to deal with everybody else getting the first goes at the water. So you get this kind of hierarchy depending on height. So you get conflicts and tensions and arguments and panics. That's the one I think is the most likely to happen. For example, something happened in the top of the Brahmaputra and the Yalong Sampo section in Tibet that dark water came flowing down. It's probably a landslide or some kind of construction accident. And because there was no communication between China and India about that landslide, there was this panic in Arunachal Pradesh in Assam that people there thought they were going to be poisoned. And there was all this kind of contextualization that the Chinese government had done it on purpose and so on, which wasn't true. But because there was this lack of communication, then that can lead to issues. Whereas on the other hand, between Bhutan and India, because they have a much more open border, they've had flood warning systems between villages living on either side of the border that they can tell each other through WhatsApp groups what is happening without getting to a stage where there's going to be a lot of tension and confusion. When we're talking about these tensions over water, I agree with Ruth that um yeah, the idea of water wars is, is a bit of a simplification and we don't really see wars being fought over water in, in this region. Um, you really see these tensions playing out between a state agency or multiple state agencies and a range of non-state actors, uh, particularly affected communities and NGOs, rather than between states. These sort of tensions can cross borders or they can be domestic and they tend to be concentrated around particular interventions or particular development projects. And there's a range of examples of that. For instance, I look at a proposed dam and water diversion project, and that's definitely the case for this. Um, it's proposed on the stretch of the Salween River that forms the Thai-Myanmar border, but the conflict isn't between Thailand and Myanmar. It's really between the Thai state agencies that are proposing the project and other communities that would be impacted. 
So you're talking then about some organizations that are non-state actors as well um, shaping this. Can you give us a list of some of those and, and how prevalent are they in this area? Yeah, so in terms of the non-state actors, I would definitely say um, communities that would be affected by development are really key in contesting development and trying to reset, reshape the way that the river is governed. Uh, there's also a range of local level, smaller NGOs that are based along the border that support these communities, and they have a lot of networks with international NGOs. And I think something that's really interesting that I might point out about the the Salween River border is that on the Myanmar side, there's also non-state actors that are political organizations that are sort of oriented around uh, ethnic groups, and they often have armed wings, and they've been in conflict with Myanmar state for about 70 years. And they also act like a state in many ways. And they definitely have a say in how the river and the environment is managed as well. Like the Karen? Yeah, like in Karen State, which is in Myanmar, and it borders Thailand, you've got the Karen National Union, which basically acts like a state in that area. The Myanmar state is not very present at the moment. So they would be the ones, I guess, calling the shots in terms of how the environment is managed and the river is managed. Your research refers to the notion of scale as central to discussions about transboundary hydropolitics. Ruth, what do you mean by scale here and what's so important about it? I mean, scale works in multiple ways when you're looking about, at this, right? So on the largest scale, you have time scales and geographic scales. Yeah. So you have processes that are unfolding in tens of millions of years. That's one time scale. And then you have things that are happening per second. So they operate at different scales. And then you have geographic scales. So you have the hydropolitics of this enormous globally defining hydrological water system that provides water and, and not just water silt like fertilizers or the fields downstream, provides landscapes for lots of animals to live in, massive system. But then you also have governance systems within states that have divided this river up with borders. And then you have smaller situations where you will note that there's like a tributary that has its own small ecology and communities, or you have one part of the river having a different ecological system to another. So for example, the Brahmaputra in one 150 kilometer section, it passes a mountain that is 7,500 meters tall. And at the bottom of this gorge, it comes out at 500 meters above sea level. So it drops seven kilometers in a hundred kilometers. And each one of those, as it drops, it drops through all of these different ecosystems from ice down through forest, down to jungle, right? So in some ways it's mind boggling scale to think of a, a river dropping that much, but it's also each little niche in that gorge is another way to look at the scale of it as well. So you can't just look at it as a big picture idea. You also need to look at little communities and little ecosystems that have found their own niche in this big, massive continent and global defining system. So you've got to keep your head spinning at all different time frames and geographical times in order to try and get a picture of what's actually happening here. Zali, when we look at the hydropolitics of this area, I mean, this idea of scale as described by Ruth can seem overwhelming. Is it possible then to even go as granular as down to communities and then pull out all the way into nation states? Yes, I think of scale as, a, in addition to what Ruth said, as a unit of analysis or of management and of assessment. So I think that's really a political choice in terms of which scale is selected for different purposes. So it's a very contested process. And for example, in environmental impact assessments or in government rhetoric, they might try and frame a development project as domestic and having domestic impacts only. And this can overlook both the transboundary impacts and local level impacts and thereby minimize impacts and justify development. So in response, um, I think communities are doing a lot of work to rescale these projects and focus on local level impacts and define these and use that to contest these projects and also to look at the transboundary impacts. So if you look at the transboundary scale, you suddenly see very different impacts that are happening downstream and different actors might be involved. So I think the scale of politics is a constant source of contestation in development processes. A good example of that kind of state influence and state control can be in the installation and maintenance of hydropower dams. Beyond state control, Zali, what roles or impacts do hydropower dams have in these transboundary river basins? Yeah, so 
I primarily study proposed dams and diversions in the Salween River Basin, where a lot of these impacts are anticipated. But I think I'll draw on some of the impacts that we already see happening in the in the Mekong River Basin. So large dams have really a range of impacts on communities and ecologies, particularly resource dependent livelihoods. So for starters, if you put a dam on a river, it blocks seasonal fish migration. So freshwater fish migrate up and down the river as part of their life cycles and for breeding. And if you put a dam there, it of course blocks this and this reduces fish catches. So the size and quantity of fish and this impacts fish's livelihoods. And that's really important in the Mekong River Basin. So you've got tens of millions of people who rely directly on fish and other aquatic animals for their livelihoods. Um, Dams also require a fairly steady water flow throughout the year. So dams serve to regulate rivers. And that's really a bit of a problem for these rivers like the Mekong and Salween, which are seasonal and monsoonal. So they have very big flows during the monsoon and smaller flows during the dry season and people's livelihoods are dependent on this. And then you put a dam there and um, there's unseasonal water releases or they withhold water during the dry season to make sure that hydropower can be produced, thereby preventing communities from accessing water downstream. Dams also block natural sediment transportation and that's really important for fertilizing the floodplains during the rainy season as well. So that impacts um, agriculture. Uh, Ruth, are there any alternative infrastructures to dams that can be and are used in the areas? Okay, we have to think about like why people are building dams, right? So most of these countries are trying to do two things. They're trying to develop fast and they're trying to transition from fossil fuels to what they're considering green, in quotation marks, power sources. Lots of them consider or they think of hydropower as being green. It's it's probably less carbon intensive, but in its impacts on environments are not very green. That's the way to think about it. And there's alternatives in terms of using other forms of non-fossil fuel energy, including solar and wind. But then there's also ways to build dams that aren't as kind of in your face and messy as the way that they're being built at the moment. So I think the two rivers that I tend to look at most is the Yangtze Yangtze River and the Brahmaputra. And on the Yangtze River, Chinese hydropower companies, which are kind of state owned, right? So this idea of state and non-state actors is a bit trickier in China because the state's kind of everywhere or most places. I mean, you have provincial states and the federal state, but it's kind of state-private partnerships. They've built one cascade dam system in the last 10 years that is twice the size, produces twice as much electricity as the Three Gorges Dam. And then they've built on the same river another cascade that's the same size as the Three Gorges Dam. And then they're going further upriver, up onto the actual Tibetan Plateau with another series of 13, a cascade of 13 dams which will have about half, produces about half as much power as the Three Gorges Dam. That area is all really earthquake prone and the energy and the silt running off the side of the plateau is intense. So it takes an enormous amount of engineering and enormous amount of cement and an enormous amount of work to put these dams in place. They're mega dams, like mega, mega, mega dams. We haven't seen anything like them in human history and they're all being plonked in that space. And there's also talk about building an even bigger hydropower station that produces four times as much power as their Three Gorges Dam on the Brahmaputra right near the Indian border in this intensely steep gorge. There's ways that you can get hydropower without building dams that freaking big basically. (laughs) You can do smaller dams spread out. You can integrate them so that you have pumped storage hydro, which is basically like what they're trying to do with Snowy Hydro in Australia, where you use the dam as a battery and it can be a smaller size. You can make power production. You can connect it more to local communities because like what's happening at the moment is these areas, which are mainly minority areas, being chocked full of dam and then the dams, hydropower dams, and then the energy is being extracted from those sites and sent off to big cities where the majority populations live. So there's ways that it can be done that are gentler and softer and more embedded in the community. It's just that the states seem to be going for the whole, you know, how big can we build a dam? How good is our engineering? That kind of approach to it, as opposed to embedding it in communities. Well, speaking of things that are being plonked down, it's not just dams. There's also inter-basin water transfer systems. Ruth, can you give us a bit of a background on what that is exactly and the impact it might be having? Right. So there's two competing 
water transfer systems. The first one is in China, within China. I find the comparison between China and India super interesting because you basically got these two countries which have one dry bit and one wet bit. So they're both trying to move water within their nation state borders from the wet bits to the dry bits. That's a great way of explaining it that I have not yet thought of. So southern China is kind of wet, yeah, and particularly the Yangtze River has an enormous water flow. It's the fourth biggest runoff in the world, yeah. So they're taking heaps of water from the Yangtze and directing it north into the Yellow River Basin which doesn't get enough water, has a lot of sediment and gets all blocked up. So the south to north water transfer system that they're developing there, and they've done two different sections of it, which is mainly downstream, like down on the plains and sending the water north from the plains. But the latest section that they're doing is connecting the rivers that are on the plateau. Remember how we were saying that there's all these four rivers that come from the northeast of the Tibetan plateau, where they're trying to get passages from one river to another, from the Yangtze's head headwaters into the yellow headwaters and direct the water to the north of China through the yellow rivers headwaters as opposed to making big channels across the plains. And there is some talk about directing water from the Brahmaputra as well into the Yangtze and then into the yellow. But then every time they do that, India rightly gets upset and there's a lot of pushback because of the environmental issues from that. So at the moment, they're just transferring from the Yangtze River Basin into the Yellow River Basin. And then India has not to be outdone because, you know, you can't let your competitor get ahead of you. They've developed their own water transfer plan, which hasn't been implemented yet. And that's basically to take water from the Brahmaputra, which has more water, into the Ganga and down into central India, which has less water. So from their wet bit to their dry bit. You're listening to Air to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and society's politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Air to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Air to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Sami Shah and I'm joined by hydropolitics researcher Zali Fung and Dr. Ruth Gamble. We're talking about the hydropolitics of the vital river systems of South and Southeast Asia. Zali, so much of this has now just been looked at through the eyes of experts who are working in dam construction and just the nation states and the consultants and everyone they might be bringing in. But there is a wealth of knowledge also on the local level, that local knowledge in shaping water policies on the ground. Are there any examples of that being applied or is it a voice that's not being heard? I think in the Mekong and Salween River Basins, you still do have a bit of a dominance of technical knowledge, for example, in environmental impact assessments, which are supposed to, quote unquote, objectively assess impacts to inform decision making. But they're often in practice used to justify developments, basically. And in response to this, we see the production of what you might call local knowledge or counter-hegemonic knowledge production to challenge these EIAs. So there's this methodology that's called Taiban research, which is where, or it was invented by development-affected communities who were impacted by dams, along with local NGOs and academics in the region. And for Taiban, community members are actually the lead researchers. So they document and research their livelihoods and local ecologies that would be impacted by development. And they do so to show the range of impacts that these development projects would actually have. So Taiban has been undertaken to challenge a range of dam projects in the region. And in the the case that I look at, which is the proposed Yuan River Water Diversion Project, so that's a diversion from the Salween River Basin to central Thailand, essentially, community members are actually undertaking what they call a people's EIA. So there's multiple topics under investigation, but they're essentially looking, for example, at what fish species there are in the local rivers, because there's actually very little research on that, despite the rich biodiversity uh, in the area and how these fish and other resources support people's livelihoods, their economic and cultural values, and they'll use this data to then challenge the Thai state-led EIA to show that the project's actually going to have much bigger impacts than the state estimated. Ruth, are we seeing similar use of the local knowledge or appreciation for the local knowledge in India and China? 
I mean, there is some, and it depends the way that the Chinese state operates, is that it has a lot of respect for expertise. Experts actually get a listen, which is good because, you know, it doesn't always happen in other places like here, maybe. But the idea of feeding up from local communities is less, is very much less, particularly in minority areas, right? So if you're looking at the Tibetan plateau and uh, the minorities that live in between the Tibetan people and the lowlands of China, there's not a lot of feedback. I mean, I keep having this image from a protest a couple of weeks ago where one monk was begging them not to flood his monastery and he just was sitting on the ground crying, begging for them not to flood this 700-year-old monastery that has frescoes that can't be moved in it. And then they actually got arrested for sending the image of that out of China. There's a real an intense security and crackdown there. So you get like amazing technological expertise in China, but not so much feedback from local communities. And then in India, there's a kind of a split because people protest. They protest vehemently and there's a big tradition of uh, food strikes and large protests. But there's also not a lot of listening as well. And the one that I've been talking to people about most recently was there was a dam broke last September in Sikkim. There's a glacial lake outburst flood where like a glacier melted, created a pond, and then that pond broke through, came down in a rush, and it literally exploded a dam an hour later. And then that dam went down to the next dam, and then they just managed to stop the next dam exploding and people died as they tried to open the gates and the second dam in the cascade. And then when I went up to the first dam that had exploded, the locals were saying, we told them. We told them so many times, glacial lake outbursts come through here. It floods. Do not build a dam here. It's stupid. We have stories. We know, you know, our grandparents told us. Even there was this one man I spoke to who was a local engineer, and he, he said they put together a massive panel and sent it to them. He said it was like they didn't even know how to understand as opposed to not listening. They didn't know how to process the information because it didn't fit into their graphs. You do get protests, but you also have a massive disconnect between a hydrocracy that's been in India since the British set it up and local knowledge that's, you know, sometimes based in like this spirit says you should do this or we have this story about this flood that came down this valley and then that doesn't work when you're trying to present it to engineers who are trying to build a dam based on numbers basically. And so there's definitely a disconnect happening in India, even in India. In India, the EAIs have stopped two dams that I know of one of them in the lecture community, which is an Indigenous community in Sikkim, and another one in uh, Arunachal Pradesh in another state, because it was going to affect the nests of a special bird, the black neck crane. So they work sometimes, like they worked in India a couple of times, but it's like if you're planning 30 dams and two get stopped, it's not going to really help the 28. We've talked so much about state actors and non-state actors. One of the voices that gets lost in all of this, of course, are the ordinary people who depend on these water resources from these important river basins. Can you give us some examples, Ruth, about local communities that are impacted and whether or not that impact has been for any of them positive? Yeah. It, I mean, it's hard. There's some people within the communities, like the one that I was talking about that used an EAI to stop a dam in the lecture community in Sikkim. There was members of that community that did actually want the dam. And the main reason that they want that is because of you get usually short-term payoffs for having the dams built in your area. People do benefit from these dams, extracting a lot of energy, feeding into these big grids that is going towards development. And, and even like Australians benefit from it because, for example, as some of the dams that were being built in Sikkim were built with money from carbon exchanges from Australia through the UN's carbon exchange networks. Right. So we get exchanges for it. But the people on the ground who live next to the dams don't seem to me to be benefiting very much. The one that keeps getting me is like I was in a village once that had no electricity <laughs> that was next to this massive hydropower dam. And I was like, how is this working? Where does it go? Does it like? And it's not just the dams themselves, but there's these massive transmission lines that pass their village that are taking the power out of their area down to the cities. 
Well, you had mentioned, right, much earlier about how so much of this is based around borders and boundaries, which were kind of arbitrarily drawn by colonial forces. Um, It's been a while now since those borders were laid down, however. Those communities that live on either side of borders, how much ethnic and regional tension do they now experience because of water politics? Yeah, so the area in Arunachal Pradesh, which is where the border goes through, there's the same communities either side of the border and they've got cousins, but they haven't seen each other in seven years. It's like India and Pakistan and Kashmir, that kind of situation. And in this day and age, it's also a WeChat WhatsApp divide. You can't have WeChat in India, you can't have WhatsApp in China. So there's like no way of people communicating with each other either side of that border as well. And Basically, their areas have already been securitized because there's lots of army in that space. So adding hydropower to that mix is just people from the plains coming into that spaces. But the way that it works as they come in, it means that not just dams come in, but dams come in, roads come in, communications come in, and you also get basically colonies of engineers living near the dams. And this kind of changes the uh, local economies and local cultures. It introduces the mainstream languages. I mean, some of these places, you can have one valley that they speak one language and the next valley over, they speak another language. Right. But if you have all of these people that are coming in to build the dam, then they're all coming from somewhere else and speak the main language of that state, like whether it's Chinese or um, Bengali or Hindi. So it really disrupts a lot of local communities in multiple ways, I think. Zali, are we seeing the similar disruption taking place along the Mekong? Is cultural diversity, cultural health, is that something that has a level of stability or is purely in flux because of transboundary politics? So thinking about the Thai Myanmar border, which is formed by the Salween River, we also see that it's Karin communities that live on both sides of the border. It's not as divided as Ruth was describing. People migrate multiple times, sometimes between the two sides of the borders throughout their lifetimes, depending on different opportunities and depending on conflict on, on one side of the border, which was actually demarcated in the late 1800s during British colonial rule of Myanmar. It's definitely Karin communities that will be impacted by these multiple proposed hydropower dams and water diversions. So they'll be impacted and the benefits will largely flow elsewhere. But because these projects are yet to be built, you don't see the same levels of disruption that Ruth was describing. Although if we think about the proposed Hatchi Dam, which is on the Myanmar side in Karin State, there were sort of some attempts to start preparing the area for construction. So new roads were built, the Myanmar military went in, who are really not welcome in that area because it's run by the current National Union, largely. So you do see increased militarization and civil society organizations did actually link sort of these preparations for the Hatchi Dam to intensified conflict as well around 2016. Ruth, China's dominance of hydro resources seems to be an area of great focus. What has China's economic and technological growth meant for the eastern Tibetan plateau river systems? Yeah, it's meant that they have been turned into pools, basically. <laughs> um, yes. Pools running through really large cascades of dams, apart from the Salween, which, thank goodness, has got like a bit of a break from, from hydropower deployments. And that seems to me to be like a standard approach that the kind of technocratic approach to the Chinese state, how it does things. It's like, okay, we're going to set this area aside for environmental protection and then we'll use this area over here for exploitation. So the Salween they've set aside for environmental protection and then the Yangtze, Yangtze and the upper Mekong and Lanchang are being completely developed for their hydropower potential. So I keep thinking of it as being like one of the Russian dolls, like on the outer layer, I guess the Chinese government would be arguing we need to transition to non-fossil fuel energies in a hurry and it was all the western nations that used all the fossil fuels and messed up the environment anyway so you know where you get off telling us not to do this yeah but then within the Chinese state they're actually exploiting the hydropower energies from in minority communities and then within Within that area, like Southwest China, Northeast India is the most intense hydropower capacity on the planet. So that's what's being exploited. And within that area, you get, I'm doing the scale thing that Sally said we should do. And then in that local area, you have really localized changes to the environment with a massive dam will mean that there's cold water and flooding north of the dam and then desiccation below it. So 
China's technology becomes like a circle, right? So China uses the energy to have more technological development. The technological development means that they can get bigger dams and they can go further up the mountains and exploit more of the hydroelectricity. So it becomes like a circle and there's a massive, massive hydrological industry in China that needs to be supported. And there's lots of jobs and money invested in it as well. So it becomes like an engine unto itself. And that's resulted not just in China, but also in exporting its investment to other parts of the world in hydro development, right? Yeah, definitely. In Africa, in Nepal is the other one that I know about where they're definitely doing this, Nepal and Pakistan. So is China then a hydro hegemon, as has been claimed by some, or is that too simplistic a description? Zali? Yeah, I'd perhaps say yes and no to that. So I guess we're not really providing straightforward answers to a lot of these questions just because the hydropolitics are so complicated. But China definitely does have, you know, the largest state-owned enterprises or they're the biggest hydropower developers globally now. And this is really facilitated by some of China's going out policies like the Belt and Road Initiative, which encouraged sort of overseas investment to keep that China water machine going, as I've heard it be called. But we might also think of some counterpoints to that because, as Ruth mentioned and as I've mentioned earlier, the Salween remains undammed and it's actually the the upper Salween, so the New River that flows through China, that is also undammed. And at the moment, that area is actually protected by a national park and that was really pushed by China's environmental movement and I believe some parts of that upper stretch are also quite earthquake prone. So it seems like that upper stretch of the river may remain undammed for the near future, at least. And in terms of hydro hegemony, we might also think about that it's not only Chinese state actors that are pushing for development. So Thai state actors are also really strong in pushing overseas hydropower development. So the Electricity Generating Authority of Thailand has invested in a range of dams in Myanmar, including Hatchi, which is unbuilt, but also in the Mekong Basin in some dams that are already built and functioning. So like Saiburi and Don Sahong dams. Um, I guess this also relates to Thailand's domestic hydropower politics, which um, hydropower is very, very resisted within Thailand. So they haven't really been able to build dams within Thailand since the 1990s. And that's seen Thailand sort of push its hydropolitics across its borders, I guess. So we also see Thailand playing a really strong role in hydropower development in Southeast Asia, mainland Southeast Asia, at least. You mentioned environmental politics or environmental impact, etc. Let's talk about climate change then for just a moment. Ruth, how profound of an impact in terms of water volume and effects downstream are current climate change predictions and projections? Well, you're dealing with the way that this massive Tibetan slash Himalayan slash Hengduan mountain area is the third pole. Right, A lot of ice and snow and permafrost sits on top of that. And in between the third pole and the oceans, you get these climate cycles, monsoons and westerly winds coming from across the continent. And basically when this precipitation, like stuff that falls from the sky, falls as snow, it just sits there and then it seeps out slowly. Yeah. And that means it kind of dribbles down. And that's why this is such an intensely peopled. And there's so many people live in the downstream regions of this because that makes perennial rivers. In the summer, the monsoon, they're very big rivers. But even in the off season, you still get dribbles of water coming down because there's snow slowly melting and ice slowly melting and coming down. But what climate change does is is intensifying those cycles. And it means that you're getting less regular snow and rain and it's coming down as rain as opposed to snow and when it comes down as rain it's like chucking a bucket of water down the side of a muddy slope it just all strips away right whereas if it had fallen as snow it dribbles down nicely yeah in a nice pattern that's going to help everyone so you're getting irregular rain it's coming down in buckets yeah and it's stripping the soil away with it and that's having really dramatic effects like the dam explosion that i talked about in sikkim it would probably not have happened 30 years ago. And we're getting more and more of these outburst floods and more and more of this circling between droughts and then chucked down like outburst. There's one expression, which is cloud lake outburst floods. And that's basically a supercell where the equivalent of a lake is dropped out of a cloud 
and and hits the side of the mountains and just kind of charges down the side of the mountain, taking everything with it, right? So glacial lake outburst floods and cloud lake outburst floods. So it's kind of destabilizing the entire climate system. So what climate change is going to do is going to stress the water supply. It's going to stress the dams. It's going to stress food production. It basically just makes everything a little bit to a lot more difficult. And there was already water shortages and there was already issues on these rivers. So it's just a threat magnifier in all capacities. Well, we've talked about how complex this entire region and also the politics on a macro and micro level are within it. Zali, I'm going to put a fairly impossible task to both of you now, starting with you. What key recommendations then would you make for policymakers and stakeholders for fostering more equitable and sustainable water governance in these basins? Yeah, I I think I've got maybe two points I could make for that. The first would really be, I guess, ensuring that decisions made about rivers and natural resources are community-led and include significant and meaningful community and civil society participation rather than tokenistic participation, which is what we've seen uh, a lot in the Mekong and Salween river basins in terms of um, environmental impact assessments. And the second one, I'm not sure how this would be possible, but I think there really needs to be some sort of paradigm shift in how rivers are viewed and understood because I think they're often considered to be uh, a resource that can be used for extraction and and taken from and you know the benefits flow somewhere else and impact local communities but these rivers actually really care for and support people so I think this relationship needs to be more reciprocal and that people uh, particularly governments and decision makers need to be caring for the rivers in the way that many um, communities that live alongside the river uh, are doing so. Ruth any recommendations you can add? That idea of taking things down, you know, taking it down to the local regions, coming up with local responses and having local people involved in decision making. And this doesn't mean to get to a stage where you've got like nimbyism, right? It's like we can't have any energy from my neighbourhood, you have to do it next door. But having like networked local connections would be, I think, the best way to do it. I mean, I still don't know if this will work, right? But before Russia did what it did, there used to be a uh, Arctic Council that included conversations between all governments in the Arctic and Indigenous peoples from each country that all had a seat on that council and they made decisions together about how to manage some of the Arctic. And it was quite successful from an international relations perspective when most of these things aren't successful. But there does seem to be this weird disconnect with the way that people understand the Asian highlands, where they get that it's important, but they don't seem to get how important. And I think it needs to be referred to in the same kind of way as we talk about the poles. This is like a special area that needs to have cooperation in order for it to be managed properly. And this cooperation needs to not just be from states, but you need to listen to the the people have the the voices from down in the communities funneled up in decision making. So maybe adopting something like an Arctic Council for the uplands would then have a positive impact on those and then that would dribble down to the lowlands like the rivers will hopefully keep doing. A literal trickle down effect then. Yeah. (laughs) Ruth, Zali, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks so much. Our guests have been Dr. Ruth Gamble of La Trobe University and Zali Fung of the University of Melbourne. Air to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Air to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it. Every positive review helps new listeners to find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on your socials. This episode was recorded on the 8th of August 2024. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Kelvin Param of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2024, the University of Melbourne. I'm Sammy Shah. Thanks for your company. Thank you.